So, good morning and welcome to Preservation 101. I am Rebecca Elder and I am a preservation consultant. I am trained as a book and paper conservator, but now I work with libraries and museums and archives doing all kinds of collections care things from figuring out how to store things to the preservation environment to emergency planning. I do an awful lot of things with an awful lot of people. It's pretty varied. So I know just enough about almost everything to not get in trouble. Um, and I know the people to call when I don't know the answers, which is a good skill. So everyone should have a copy of a resource list which is short and highly curated, but it's kind of the places that I tend to go first when I'm looking for information or when I'm looking for references. And what we're going to do today is, depending on how class goes, this could go two ways. Um, I, am, I have a talk prepared that's like 45 minutes-ish, I think, depending on how much you all ask questions during that 45 minutes. Um, the talk itself could go 75 minutes depending on what you all want, or it could go 45 minutes depending on what you all want. If we run, if we run short on time, so if we run, so if we're at the four, closer to the 45 minute mark, I also have a tabletop exercise that we can break into small groups and do and practice some of the things that we've talked about today. Um, so we'll just play it by ear and see how it goes. Fair enough? Um, so as we're going through, if you have questions about what I'm saying or questions that are particular to your collections, don't hesitate to ask them. Um, but we're going, to, and this is going to be a very broad, mile wide, not even an inch deep, half an inch deep overview of preservation and everything that affects preservation. So um, by the end of the session, if, I, if we do this right, you will be able to tell me how paper and photographs deteriorate. You will know the importance of a good preservation environment and what that means. You will be able to choose the right storage materials. And if we get to the tabletop exercise, you'll be able to analyze conditions in your own collections to try to make some recommendations about how to fix things. Because nobody has perfect collections. So we're going to start out at the very beginning and just talk about what it means when we say preservation because it's a pretty broad umbrella. I think a lot of the time we think it's just what boxes do we use and it's so much more. So preservation is the professional discipline of protecting materials by minimizing chemical and physical deterioration and damage to minimize the loss of information and to extend the life of cultural property, or the act of keeping from harm, injury, decay, or destruction, especially through non-invasive treatment. Um, this is the definition from the Society of American Archivists, which is one of my big pre professional associations. And I think it's a good all-purpose definition to begin with. One of the points for me that's really important here is non-invasive. There are a lot of things that we can do to extend the lives of our collections without even touching them. So I thought I would throw it out to you all and just ask what some of the things we do to protect our collections are. Humidity yes, controlling our temperature and relative humidity. That is gigantic. Pest control. Yes, oh yes, pest control. We could do a whole week on pest control if we wanted to. Yes. Sorry? Access control. Yes. Who gets, who gets their hands on things? Um, another way to put that is security. And that broadens it out as well, because it also includes what's going on outside your building. Light control. Light. Mm-hmm. Yes, good storage supplies. There are only a couple on my list that haven't come up. Um, reformatting, so moving things from one medium to another. And all preservation 
is really just putting off the ultimate reformatting before your object becomes completely useless. So we're just trying to make that take as long as possible. Um, emergency preparedness. Having an emergency plan goes directly to the heart of protecting your collections. Using good handling practices. So wearing gloves when it's appropriate, not when it's not appropriate. Um, picking things, picking objects up by their bases instead of their handles. And conservation is kind of the last resort. So most of what preservation is is proactive. It's all the things we do before there's damage. Conservation is reactive. It's what we do when all of our best preservation efforts fail. So preservation is gigantic. It's much more than just using the right kinds of boxes. But I think to understand everything, it's important to know a little bit about how paper is made. Um, and that's paper is kind of the basic material you find in archival collections. So that's where we're going to start. What you're seeing there is a patent drawing from the first paper making machine. But paper making starts way before machines. Um, if you're ever on Jeopardy, it might be helpful to know that paper was invented in 105 AD in China. Um, and then it kind of slowly made its way to Europe. And we're going to talk about the Western paper making tradition because that's, I'm assuming most of what you have in your collections is Western paper. Um, so until the 19th century, paper was mostly made from cotton or linen rags. And you would set, it in, set them in a pit of water in the ground let them sit there till they rotted and got all slimy and disgusting, and then put them into a machine called a stamper, which has paddles that go and separate these rotted pieces of, fi of fabric into beautiful fibers. Then you take these fibers and put them in a vat of water, and that's what you see going on here. There's your vat. The paper maker has a mold and deckle, which basically looks like a window screen that you dip into the water. All of the water falls out of the screen. All of the fibers stay right on top of the screen. You turn that out onto a piece of felt and squish it, and let it dry, and you have a piece of paper. So paper is basically a group of fibers that are twined around each other and held together with weak chemical bonds. So it's amazing that it's as sturdy as it is. However, so it's beautiful. Hand paper making, that paper, if you were ever to come visit me where I live in Austin, I would take you to our rare books library and you would see our copy of the Gutenberg Bible, which is on paper. That's what, pushing 600 years old and it's paper that is so beautiful and flexible and white and creamy that you just kind of want to rub it all over your face. Um, they won't let you, but you just kind of would want to. However, this, as you can probably figure out, is very labor intensive. And along came the 19th century, and we had the rise of literacy and the Industrial Revolution. And all of a sudden, people needed more paper more cheaply and more quickly. So they had to start improving the process, which, of course, does not necessarily lead to an improved product. So the first thing that happens is the paper making machine comes into use. Um, and as long as you make paper with good materials, machine made paper is every bit as good as man made paper. Um, there's some little differences in how the fibers line up, but machine made paper made out of cotton will last for long enough that it won't be your problem when it starts to deteriorate. However, we had some other things going on too. So we had chlorine being used to bleach paper, which causes the chemical bonds to weaken. In the 19th century, mid 19th century, we had wood replacing rags for most paper making. And that becomes a problem that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, I'm gonna pass a copy of the hand around 
And also by the 1840s, something called alum rosin size was in good use. And that's a 20th century paper making machine. So you can see the scale of how enormous this thing is. It's pretty impressive. But it's the same principle. Here is a big vat that's filled with paper fibers dispersed in water. They pour out onto screens that shake back and forth, go through all these rollers that press them into shape and dry them out. And at the end, it rolls onto a roll of beautiful paper as long as it's made with cotton and cellulose. So what makes good paper? This is a cellulose molecule. molecule. You do not have to understand the chemistry of it. What you should take away is that that is a pretty simple molecule. There's not a ton going on there. Because it's so simple, and it's actually, it's a polymer, so it's multiple units of that chained together, but it's still very simple. Because it's so simple, there's not a lot of opportunity for interaction with outside forces, so it's very stable. The paper will stay white and flexible for a long, long time. <clears throat> it's just it's a very chemically stable molecule. However, when we bring wood into the picture, Ah, um, that it's not as simple a picture anymore. So if we have groundwood pulp, that's exactly what it sounds like. You take a tree, grind it up, disperse that in water, and it becomes your paper. Now you haven't taken the time to rot everything into these beautiful, long, strong fibers. You are just grinding it up and you have these little short stumpy fibers and they're cellulose but wood has its cellulose fibers bound together with a substance called lignin which is the molecule you'll see you're seeing there and that's about 30 35 percent of most trees and it's very difficult and expensive to separate lignin from the cellulose the function of lignin is to give the tree structure if you don't have lignin, your tree will not be able to grow 20 feet. It'll just kind of slump over on the ground, I suppose. But the problem with lignin is that when it's exposed to heat or light, it turns brown and releases acids that catalyze deterioration within paper. Um, so remember when you used to go have take a Sunday paper and you would be away for the weekend and come back a few days later and the newspaper would be turning yellow on your front porch? That's lignin doing what lignin does. So it happens really, really quickly. And these days, the most common example of paper that's made entirely of groundwood pulp without any lignin removed is newspaper or cheap paperbacks. So now we're going to look at how a paper actually deteriorates. And again, you don't really need to understand the chemistry at a high level. It's just an easy visual representation. So there's our cellulose molecule. And it deteriorates via something called a hydrolysis reaction. So what happens is the cellulose molecule here interacts with an acid molecule plus a water molecule. So the acid molecule is from the lignin, or it's from air pollution, or it's just from some random thing that happens to leave an acid molecule lying around. Water is from the humidity in the air. All three of those come together, and it breaks your cellulose molecule in two and leaves another acid molecule that's then free to find another water molecule and another cellulose molecule to um, interact with and cleave it into again. So your molecules get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And the shorter your molecules become, the more brittle your paper is. Does that make sense? So everything we're doing really is trying to slow down those hydrolysis reactions. Um, now I want to talk. Oh, miss that. I want to talk very briefly about photos. Photos are are more complex than paper, so we're going to add a layer onto this. 
And photographic prints and negatives are made of three parts. You have a primary support and a binder and imaging material, which is all those little blue dots. And all three of those parts influence the stability of your photographs. The earliest supports were paper, but you can put a photograph on anything. So paper in England, metal in France, silver. Um, tin types are on iron. Amber types are on glass. Um, anything can be turned into a photograph. The binder is the material that holds your image material to the support. <clears throat> So I kind of think of the binder as the jello, and then the image material as the fruit cocktail and miniature marshmallows and all the things you would actually eat the jello to get to. That's the imaging material. Um, the imaging material actually shows the image, and for most of the history of photography, it was silver. But color photography is dyes. And one of the great things about photos is that for most of the history of the form, all the photographers were making their own supplies. So there are unlimited variations on this kind of open face sandwich. And everybody has their own way of doing it, which makes it difficult to predict patterns of deterioration. But when photos do deteriorate, some things that we can expect to happen. Um, photos are made of layers of, pic of materials, which we saw in the last slide. So if you want to be fancy and conservatory, you would call it a laminate structure. And that laminate structure makes things a lot more complex because every time your temperature and relative humidity shift, the layers move at different rates, which can lead to cracking and cockling. Silver is, deter is degraded when you expose it to oxidizing gases and atmospheric moisture. So you get discoloration, fading, and something called silver mirroring, which you see going on in this picture. Um, that silver in the picture is tarnishing very similarly to how your silver flatware would tarnish. But we can't take a cleaning pad to, to the photograph, sadly. Um, you may have residual processing chemicals left behind, and that can cause more fading and discoloration um, and staining. So photos, more complex objects. And we could, again, we could do, we could do a semester on photos easily, but today we're going to do 10 minutes.